So Psalm 117 says this. It is, like I said, short, but it is significant. Turns out hard to do day in and day out. It says, praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth. For his unfailing love for us is powerful. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Now listen, I don't know about you, but I I don't know anybody who doesn't like being praised, who doesn't like receiving praise, whether it's that you did well on a test at school or whether you were applauded by uh, your your parents or maybe colleagues at work, a boss or friend or family. Um, Human beings, we like receiving praise. Praise, we do. Uh, do you remember receiving your grade school? Listen, I'm going to ask you to think a little bit back, okay? It's, do you remember receiving your grade school papers, tests, exams? Yes, you remember giving teachers, giving out your tests to your students. Uh, I remember, listen, like if you got a test and it was face up, that was a good thing, right? Teachers walking around and face up, puts it on your desk, face up. What was that? That's a, listen, you did well. What was, uh, what was uh, the, the, listen, if it, if it wasn't face up, it was, maybe it was face down. I got some face down tests in my time. Face down, uh, that's the one everybody was a little worried to get, right? Not so good. What was worse than face down for me with my teachers was folded in half. I don't know if you ever received a test that was folded in half and then placed down, because folded in half usually meant like an F, like not, not for like fun either, but like in it for fail. Uh, that was it. That was, I, listen, I've gotten some folded down and upside down and right side up tests, all of them, uh, in, my, in, my, in my day. Um, and I, it was one of those things. Like, I remember, like, you're like, Oof, test going around. I hope it's face up. And why is it maybe, maybe face up? Maybe the person next to me will see how well I did. Hey, look, look, I got a face up test. Like, I don't know about you, but teacher put my test face up. That's a good thing. Uh, we like, listen, like, we like being praised for the job that we do. We like doing a, do, doing a good job. I, I think as human beings, like we're, we're wired to work and, and to do good work. And, and we like being recognized for it, and that's okay. Uh, we like feeling good about what we do. We like feeling good maybe about how we look. We like feeling good about ourselves. Now listen, like I'm all for some positive reinforcement. I think that the problem becomes for human beings is that maybe we, we like feeling good about ourselves like a little too much. Uh, We we like feeling a little too good about about ourselves or we put a little bit too much stock in how we feel about ourselves and how we are uh, presenting to the world or how people see us, how they value us. We like feeling good about ourselves, maybe just a little bit too much. It's like the person who is so humble, right? They're so humble, they can't stop talking about how humble they are with you. You've had that conversation? C.S. Lewis, he's got a couple great lines about humility and about learning this uh, uh, healthy sort of self-perception. He says, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be, and this could be anybody, doesn't even have to be a man, but if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble now, uh, nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person. Um, If you're like me, you might have to look up smarmy after the service. That's okay. Um, Who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. Took a real interest in you. Right? If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. In Mere Christianity, uh, C.S. Lewis, he figured out how to make his quotes a little bit shorter and more concise. He said this about hu- uh, humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And I know I've used that quote before, but it's, it's, a, it's not a quality thing. It's not about degrading yourself. It's not about thinking that you are a, like a horrible person. It's humility is not about embracing this like woe is me mentality. It's not a quality thing. It's a quantity thing. He says it's just thinking about yourself less, a little less. 
In Matthew 6, uh, you thought we'd escaped Matthew, I'm sorry. Um, Jesus says this, he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. What Jesus is saying to be honored by others is really, literally, to be glorified by others. Don't do what you do in order to receive glory from people. If you dig a little deeper into the translation, you could actually read this, to be praised by others, to receive praise for what you have done. Don't, don't do what you do out of selfish ambition so that you can be seen, so that you receive glory, so that you receive praise. And I think what these quotes remind us is, is that the human heart, for many of us, the human heart naturally gravitates toward wanting praise and wanting honor and wanting glory for itself. We're naturally inclined as human beings, toward the things that are not always good. We're naturally inclined toward what is not always good. And so often our wants and our desires, they need to be drawn back into alignment with God, with what God has created for humanity. And so I think that this psalm, one of the things that this psalm does for us, it's small, but it's significant. What it does is it reorders and reorganizes our life. It reorders the way we live our life with one simple reminder. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You, creature, designed to give praise to your creator. One who is loved, one who is created by God, designed to give God praise. And so I think one of the questions, listen, it becomes, what does it mean to praise? What does it mean to praise the Lord? What does it mean when the psalmist invites you, me, to praise the Lord? Literally, um, you could say this. Literally, it's to address in a loud voice. To address, address loudly. <laughs> to, in other words, like to commend. To give glory to. To congratulate. To speak highly of. Uh, it's interesting to me that in Greek, the word glory, which Jesus used, and we're going to use throughout this, this sermon a little bit, that word means to magnify, to make big, to make great, uh, even to shine. You can think of making big, making large, making great who God is and, and what God has done, or to shine a light on what God has accomplished. In, in most contexts, in most settings, um, to give praise usually happens, occurs in a public setting. It is to speak these things toward God, about God, in public, in plain view of, of people. There's an Easter hymn that goes, you may know this, all glory, laud, and honor. Right? All glory, laud, and honor to the Redeemer King. That's the last time you'll hear me sing in a microphone. From whom the children may. Anyway, it is a hymn that encourages, that invites you to speak these words, right? All glory, all laud, <coughs> excuse me, all honor to God, to Jesus as King. As simply as I can find words to express what it means to praise God is to lift high the name of Jesus. To lift high the name of Jesus. For what reason? We're going to get to that in a minute. Why does praise reorder and reorganize your, your life? Because it is the intentional practice of lifting high the name of Jesus above every other name in your life. Above every other thing in your life. So the psalm reminds us, first, listen, the first line of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name to hallow the name, to make holy the name of Jesus, to set apart God's name, to consecrate it. Praise the Lord, lift high the name of Jesus. The psalmist encourages everyone. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth. This is a good turn in the Psalms. It's a good turn in, in this one Psalm because what it's not saying is praise the Lord, 
you people of Israel. He's saying, praise the Lord, everyone. Literally, what it says is, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. All nations. Every nation, including us, point to God's love and God's mercy. Praise God for what he has done, not just for the people of Israel, but for everyone. The psalm turns. Biblical Israel was always meant to bless the world, all nations, right? God's people were blessed. Why? So that they could be a blessing to those around them. And here they're encouraged, the world is encouraged, everyone is encouraged, the nations, to praise God. This is a psalm that encourages everyone everywhere to praise God. Martin Luther I talked about this psalm as being this psalm that prophetically points us toward Jesus. It points us toward the reality that in Jesus, God would extend his covenant to all peoples. And so already in Psalm 117, already here we see hints that of what would become true for the entire world, that not just a specific people in a specific time and a specific place would be invited to praise God, but all people in all times and all places are invited and challenged and encouraged and pointed toward praising Jesus. We see hints of what would come true through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that God's blessing would extend to all people, all Gentiles. In Romans 15, Paul appeals to this psalm in particular to show how God's love and mercy had extended toward all people, even the Gentiles, because early on in the church, early on in the history of the church, like there, there was conflict. I don't, this will surprise you, but listen, like there are seasons of conflict in the church. That doesn't surprise anybody, right? So listen, like there's this early church and they're forming and there's people who are like, well, uh, we're, we're, we're Jewish, so we're the people of God. And so this is, Jesus is our Messiah. And then, then it extends the gospel, what happens? The gospel extends beyond just Jewish followers of Jesus to Gentile followers of Jesus. And they begin being baptized and joining the church and there's conflicts that happen. We're like, well, listen, like, shouldn't these Gentiles have to become Jewish first and so that then they can become a follower of Jesus and they're trying to figure out life together. Who has a place at the table? And what Paul says, says, listen, accept one another then as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God for the sake of lifting high the name of Jesus. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed and moreover that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy so that all people might glorify God because of his mercy as it is written. And this is where he quotes the psalm. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all peoples extol him. And again in Isaiah, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. All people, praise the Lord. Why? It says because of, in light of, his unfailing love for us. For his unfailing love for us is powerful in my translation, it reads. I think up on the screen we said, for great is his love, or his great love is unfailing. The Hebrew word here is chesed. Chesed, mercy, it's loving kindness, unfailing love. It's this merciful, loving kindness. It is covenantal love. It is love between God directed toward humanity and humanity then directed back toward God. And in Hebrew, in this psalm, one of the commentaries actually points out that, that the word chesed is repeated twice. So it's actually for his chesed, chesed is great. Now in English, like if we want to emphasize something, what happens? I speak a little louder when I'm talking to you, right? And you're like, oh, okay, I'm awake, I promise, right? Or if we're writing a letter, you put an exclamation mark. And then you get the email that's like exclamation mark in every sentence. And then you get the one that's what? Bolded, all caps. And you're like, are you yelling at me in an email? Like, is what? what's happening here? But we have devices for emphasizing words and statements. Right? In Hebrew, in, in Greek as well, 
uh, there were like, not like exclamation marks. There's no way to do it. There wasn't like italics. In fact, uh, most of the words were bunched together. You didn't even have spaces in between a lot of them. What you had to do was repeat a word. And so if you see a word twice, it's not a mistake. If I write a word twice in a sermon, chances are it's because I was a little sleepy and I wrote that word twice. But in Hebrew, it is intentional. In Greek, it is intentional. It is to emphasize something. And so when we read here his hesed, hesed is great. The psalmist is saying, this is extra great. God's loving kindness, his mercy, his covenantal love is great. He wants you to read it twice, right? It's kind of like, more like a parent trying to get their kid's attention Right? We say their name once, and when they don't listen, you say their name twice. And then if that doesn't work, then you say their middle name, and then you're like, oh, I know I'm in trouble now. Uh, this is how it works, repeated for emphasis. What does the psalmist want the people, all people, to know? God's love, his mercy, his loving kindness, his covenantal love, his love toward you is great. In the NLT, it says, his unfailing love is powerful. And that's that great. In some of your translations, it probably reads great. And in the NLT, this is why we read from the NLT this morning, it says that his God's love is powerful. It isn't talking about God's sentimental love for you being big. He's not talking about this like grand emotion God's love toward you feels like this big thing. Um, Evie, one of my daughters, really likes the children's book right now, Guess How Much I Love You. And it's these two like big hair, little, like little brown hair and big brown hair. And um, it's like, guess how much I love you. And there's like, to the tips of your toes. And then to the tips of your toes. And then there's this line at the end, right? Guess how much I love you. There's this line, I love you, what, to the moon? And then big nut brown hair, right, says, I love you to the moon and back. And Evie started saying, I love you to infinity and beyond and back. And that's not what the psalmist is writing about here. We're talking about God's love. God's love is different. God's love is powerful. In other words, God's love accomplishes what it intends to accomplish. It is powerful to do what it sets out to do. It's not that it feels big for you and that's a good emotion and it feels all like snuggly and warm. God's love is powerful in that it does what it needs to do. To say that God's unfailing love for us is great, it's not wrong, but it begs the question, will it possibly run out? God's love is great. How great? Like, is there an end to it? To say that God's unfailing love for humanity is powerful is to say that it does something. It actually has influence. In 1 John uh, 1 John chapter 4, if you're going to turn to it, you can, but likely written by the same John who wrote the gospel, probably in Ephesus at the time. He defines love like this, and I think this is helpful. He says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. So firstly, love begins with God. It doesn't begin with us, it doesn't begin with me, it doesn't begin with how I feel about it. It begins with God's movement toward humanity. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And in verse nine, this is what I want you to hear, these next few lines. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is the loyal, covenantal God, or love of God, repeated twice for emphasis, reminding us that it will and it has accomplish what God intends, salvation. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as what? An atoning sacrifice for our sins. That feels different to me than emotional love, than a feeling that we have. This is God's movement toward humanity. One commentator puts it like this. This is mercy times two. All right, this is God's love like exponentially blown up. God's love, his unfailing love, his unfailing mercy is powerful. 
and it prevails over sin and death and hell. And then we read, if we continue reading, the steadfast, the Lord's faithfulness endures forever. In the book of Hebrews, it says, uh, there's this line that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and again, like so many verses, this, this one line in Psalm 117, it's, it's more than just like a feel good, I love you forever, I love you for always kind of sentimental statement. You can guess at like all the children's books I've been reading over the last little while. There's a line from one. Okay. Another way you can translate this line would be to say the Lord's truthfulness endures forever. The truth of God's love, the reality of God's love for you endures forever. You see, so often we take what we see and what we experience, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between, and, and we project it onto God, and this is not a new thought, and this is not a new idea. But like as a parent, as a spouse, as a friend, all the experiences we have of love, the good experiences we projected onto God, the bad experiences especially, we, we project them onto God and they form and shape our opinions of how maybe the love burned us in the past is gonna continue to burn us into the future. And listen, like if you had somebody who said they loved you and all they did was hurt and wound and give you trauma all your life, like it's gonna shape, it's gonna change how you think about language around somebody standing up and saying God loves you, it, it does. But we need to learn again how to allow what God says and what scripture says about God to shape our expressions of love. So I love this verse when I read from 1 John. The writer doesn't say like, God loves us, go us. Aren't we great? God loves us, hey, yay us, wow. Isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful, but that's not what he says. He makes this turn, and he says, hey, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another, not with a sentimental, feel-good, cozy little bear hug kind of love. With what kind of love? A self-sacrificial love. Like we've just read, this is how God shows his love. He sent his son as an atoning sacrifice, read there, to die on a cross. We also must go and love one another. Okay. The Lord's faithfulness, the truth of what God has accomplished, victory over sin and over death, it endures forever. And we can live differently because of it. And then the writer says, hallelujah. Literally, hallelujah. He says, praise the Lord. This is how the psalm ends literally as hallelujah. When you read it in Hebrew, two words translated as praise the Lord actually says hallelujah. And so every time, every time you've spoken that word, you've sung that word, you've shouted that word, you've heard it, hallelujah. When you speak that, you're speaking this line, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you peoples of the earth, for his unfailing love for us is powerful. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.